Hello, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Dan Ashley, anchor of ABC7 News, KGO Television, and a longtime board member of the Commonwealth Club and your moderator for today. And very delighted to uh, be here in that capacity today. We have a really fascinating uh, woman and fascinating subject matter for you today. As the club continues to host virtual events, we are very grateful, deeply grateful for the continued support of our members and our donors. We hope you will consider making a donation online or text donate to 415-329-4231. That's donate to 415-329-4231. It is my great pleasure to welcome today Lynn Cheney, former second lady of the United States and author of the Virginia Dynasty, Four Presidents and the Creation of the American Nation. You know, Lynn has been fascinated with history as long as she can remember. She has devoted, in fact, much of her life to writing to help ensure the education and historical understanding of this great country for the next generation. Lynn has written 12 books, including six bestsellers about American history for children. Her latest work focuses on the first four Virginia presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. And just a reminder, we will be taking your questions and I would love to hear from you and put those questions to Mrs. Cheney. So please submit those questions in the chat box. Uh, Lynn, thank you so much for being here today. We are delighted to have you uh, on the program at the Commonwealth Club. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. This book is fascinating. I finished reading it a couple of days ago. What led you to write this particular book? I had written a, an autobiography, I'm sorry, a biography of James Madison before. And as I was writing that, it, it occurred to me how much greatness had been encompassed by a, a, a circle to the east of the Blue Ridge. That Madison um, had was born there, grew up there, had his home there. The same was true for Washington, for Jefferson, and for Monroe. It, and it, the, the dynamics of it um, intrigued me. How is it that uh, these four men in this small place, in what was a backwater of the world, really, uh, came to invent the United States, really? Uh, write the Declaration of Independence, win the revolution, the Constitution, getting the new government underway, doubling the size of the nation, the, their accomplishments, of course, go on and on. And why? How did that happen in this place, in this time? And that was the, the question, the mystery that uh, started me down this rabbit hole. And that unique connection that these four men had being from the same geographic area. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Lynn, roughly a 60 mile radius, very yes. close proximity. Yes, yes. And, uh, and you describe it as a backwater. What is it about that area that could produce for uh, men of s such great stature and, and uh, scholarly ability and great intellect? Uh, a backwater in the eyes of the rest of the world. And I think the Virginians had a little bit of an infer inferiority complex themselves. But I think that the dynamic was that they helped one another, they challenged one another, um, they inspired one another um, as they watched the way to success. And, and they also all became interested in this topic, um, topic project of uh, creating a new nation, partly because they talked together, they conversed. But don't let me fool you, they also had uh, grand and glorious fights. And those true, those two had historical consequence. And so they, they were friends and colleagues, but they also uh, clashed with one another. That's right. And uh, they were especially friends and colleagues at the beginning. And then Madison, Jefferson, and Monroe uh, broke away from Washington. Why is that? It was... Uh, a political difference, but as they saw politics, it was about the future of this country, the future of this uh, unique undertaking, they called it an experiment that could improve human life. And so they didn't just think, okay, he thinks one way, we think another. They thought to themselves, Washington just wants to take us back to a government that's like the monarchy we just escaped from. 
He wants a very central government. He also had this idea, which I think many politicians would find uh, attractive, that the voters should elect the president, their representatives, and then leave them alone. You know, let them govern on their own. Don't bother them with uh, criticism. Well, the other three understood um, that you could not have um, a democracy, a republic. You could not have that unless people could complain, unless people could try to change your mind, unless people could say terrible things about you in the in the newspapers. And, and that was key to the break. And uh, the latter three, the younger three, went in one direction. And uh, really, the relationship with Washington was... Uh, irreparably damaged. That's utterly fascinating, and I did not realize that. And something you, you wrote in the book, uh, a line that stuck with me, that st struck me as a little bit sad, which was George Washington had many admirers, but few friends. You know, I've, I've heard, read about the, the loneliness of uh, uh, being in a high place. Um, if, if that is a, a true phenomenon, then Washington illustrates it well. He he wanted, he was desperate sometimes for someone in, in whom he confide, he could confide, and he'd find someone um, and that person would betray him. Uh, one lawyer uh, from Philadelphia whom in whom he thought he had found the, the confidant that uh, he so much wanted, <sighs> went behind his back and criticized him uh, for being indecisive with another one of the generals in the uh, Continental Army. So he, it, whenever he tried to reach out, it didn't work. And he was a notoriously quiet man, wasn't he? John Adams said that he had the gift of silence. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's such an important observation. It, there is power in sitting and listening and not jumping in uh, every time the conversation falls silent. There is power in that, and Washington understood that. It's the old uh, E.F. Hutton commercial, isn't it? When when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. So That's he, good, was, yes. he was sparing in his words, so when he did speak, people stopped what they were doing and listened. Exactly. That's that's a really good observation. Uh, it, it, you know, what's interesting to me, if, if George Washington had this vastly different view or significantly different view of how government should work or how elected officials should be able to operate that caused a break with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. How, why he ended up being our first president with a, a different view of, of how that office should be conducted and government should be conducted. I don't think they had really uh, had time to um, discuss all of the potential roads this government could go down. And, and Washington was the hero. He um, was the hero of the revolution, a man uh, of such commanding stature and presence that uh, everyone knew he should be the first president and uh, they, they selected him to be that. He was also of an older generation than the other three. And, you know, I call them a dynasty because four of the first five presidents, the four I write about, um, four of them were from this little area in Virginia, so that seemed dynasty-like to me. Um, but, but Washington was older, um, and I think he just hadn't adapted to this new idea. He thought that the ideals on which the country was founded, liberty, equality, justice, that those were most admirable. But he just hadn't adapted to the idea that uh, running a republic could be rough business, hmm. that um, people would attack you. He was very sensitive. At one point, he threw a temper tantrum in a cabinet meeting because of a cartoon that had been drawn of him. He was very sensitive to the media, and that was uh, part of what made his job hard for him yeah. and <laughs> part of what made him think, just leave me alone and let me govern let me do my job. Uh, he, he would not have had much fun uh, with today's media and, and uh, social media, I suspect, Lynn. You know, I, I sometimes say that uh, back and forth rivalry was as uh, vitriolic as anything we have today. They called each other terrible names. They accused each other of nefarious deeds. But what they did uh, was use newspapers 
for their uh, medium. Today, those same kinds of charges and countercharges, uh, as you pointed out, are spread by social media, they're on television, they're on the radio, they're, they're everywhere. And so those same comments um, ha have been magnified, amplified, as though there's a very large megaphone um, from which to deliver them. That's an important difference. That is a that is a significant difference. Uh, I, well, there's so much to, to to get to here, Lynn. But let me start. Let me move into this quickly. I would love to discuss very briefly each of these four men that you describe uh, mm. as part of a dynasty in the early days of of the of the formation of this country. Um, George Washington was very well aware, was he not, of his presence and his power as a figure, and a, mm. he. Was he vain about it? A little. Uh, he uh, dressed for the occasion, and he had a theory that, especially in war, uh, men would be inspired by leaders who had on fine uniforms, and his uniform was always uh, very fine. He ordered them specially and designed them specially. Uh, I'm not sure that that's vanity, I suppose, but it's also what he regarded as a, a leadership tool. You have to also remember that Washington was not only tall, handsome, brave, he was very rich. Mm. He uh, had married Martha Custis and was one of the richest men in Virginia. So uh, John Adams, again, in his observations, uh, thought that was part of Washington's attraction. Ah, okay. That sort of uh, economic and physical presence and that sort of power. Yeah. That he had, yeah. uh, there was a mystique about him even then. Not, mm -hmm. even, there is certainly today, but even in his time, uh, there seems to have been a great deal of mystique around him. Thomas Jefferson was not a rich man. I mean, he was sort of a rich man in trappings, but he was in debt much of his life, was he not? Yes. Um, but he always thought that his assets uh, were greater than his liabilities. Um, and especially after the panic of 1819, this, this was not the case. Jefferson's uh, unique character and, and unique in, I don't know, all the world perhaps, was this uh, ability to have flights of imagination, to uh, think of thoughts that no one had thought of before. And sometimes they were crackpot ideas. Uh, Madison would let him know when, when that was the case or let him know when he was stepping out of bounds. But that imagination um, that took him from everything from taxonomy to astronomy to building gadgets. Um, if you uh, are lucky enough to go to Monticello, you'll see beautiful. The, the, it is beautiful. You'll also see some of his gadgets, including a little machine he made that copied so that when you wrote your letter, another little pen was copying it. It was a terrible um, burden in those days, particularly if you thought you were going to be important and you wanted to save all your correspondence to have it copied. Mm. And so he came up with this. I, I think he continued to use copiers, human copiers nonetheless. Sure. But he came up with the first, the early Xerox, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good analogy. Uh, he was remarkable, you know, and I've often said, if I ha were to have the great opportunity of having lunch with one of them, it would be Jefferson. I mean, really? just can you imagine his conversation? Just, uh, and he was said to be a good conversationalist and he liked talking to women. Awesome. So, you know, all of these things, uh, meant that, uh, you know, an hour spent with him would be very, um, very nice. Well, uh, you, George Washington was a bit more stoic, and uh, I think I have an alarm going off, uh, a bit more stoic, a bit more reserved, maybe not the conversationalist Thomas Jefferson was. He was characterized by this great presence and dignity and, and authority. Thomas Jefferson, you describe as someone who had a great curiosity and fertile mind. How would you describe James Madison's nature and essence? Well, of the four, he was the steadiest. Uh, when there were great uh, controversies going on and great clashes of personality, Madison was the last one to hurl an insult and it wouldn't be very much of one. He, um, he, he kept his feet on the ground. And as I say, he pulled Jefferson back from these flights of imagination that threatened to carry him into the stratosphere. 
he um, he could be counted on. You know, when when Washington died, uh, Jefferson didn't go to his funeral. Uh, Monroe was otherwise occupied, um, and and only made one remark about Washington's death, which was very self centered on Monroe himself. But Madison delivered a very nice eulogy in the House of Representatives. So it just gives you a, a point. Madison felt as strongly about the politics of the situation. He did not want a monarchical government, but he was calmer. He was steady. And I find that very appealing. Uh, that is very interesting. And it's interesting to know who attended George Washington's uh, funeral and who did not. How about James Monroe? How would you describe uh, his essence? Well, first, uh, Monroe has not had much written about him, partly because his papers haven't been available. Now, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know and all of your uh, viewers know that having the original papers, you know, in digital form, of course, it is just crucial to understanding another human being. And for a long time, Monroe's have not been available they're now available. Um, maybe there's one volume left to go. So you see a very interesting man. He was the poorest of the three of the four. And I don't know, they were probably also uh, all hyper ambitious, but Monroe let his ambition show. And it, you know, Madison and Jefferson, while never laughing at him, sort of understood that uh, you know he held his honor uh, very high and any insult to it would uh, send him around the bend. He, um, he was less, uh, he had a mind, this is a quote, neither rapid nor rich. This was uh, said, written by a man who knew him well, but he worked hard, he had good judgment, he listened to smart people, and at the end of it all, he was a good president. Interesting. That uh, talk about damning with faint praise. A man with what was a mind with that was neither rapid nor rich. Rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fascinating. You you say that these men were hyper ambitious, ambitious for themselves, but also for the country. Well, how that that's a really good question. I think that their ambition was inspired by their finding themselves in the particular time and place they did. They had all, Washington had on his own, but the other three formally studied um, the Enlightenment and particularly the Scottish Enlightenment, which thought that man acting uh, with reason rather than dogma could create a better world, could create a world where innate rights like justice and liberty uh, were recognized. So they have the Enlightenment going on. They're children of the Enlightenment, so to speak. And then suddenly comes this amazing uh, event, the uh, revolution, the country, the colonies throw off the rule of Britain, and there's a nation to be built. So they had this amazing background that prepared them to do this. And uh, then they had the opportunity uh, to, to do it. And I, yes, I think that is a kind of ambition. I think they were, per, they all knew they were historical figures. So um, maybe that's ambition already fulfilled, I'm not sure. But they did have this uh, knowledge that they could do great things. Um, unlike most human beings, they were perfectly positioned to do great things. They were at the right time, at the right place, the right combination or constellation of factors. Very interesting Lynn, that, that, you, that they were well aware of their moment in history and that they were in fact historical figures. That must have been a very heady time. Oh, I'm sure it was. You know, Wordsworth uh, wrote about being uh, in France at the beginning of the French Revolution, which in the beginning was quite a thrilling thing. And uh, he wrote something like, oh, what joy it was to be young and to be in this particular place. Of course, our revolution worked out much better, so I think they had a, <laughs> an even more fulfilling time. Uh, they were so they were idealists when it came to the the nation that they envisioned creating, but they were also practical men, were they not? Yes. Um, well, Jefferson was the least practical. 
Um, the other three, it's hard to judge. Uh, Madison also had um, the gift of perseverance and study. He, um, he put the perseverance into learning about constitutions. From the time he was a student at Princeton, he had been interested mm -hmm. in how countries develop the framework um, upon which they will build. So he, he had studied constitutions for years and years and quite intensely uh, right before the Constitutional Convention. So there was something about Madison um, that, that set him apart. You, is there anything, uh, there must be many things, but what would you highlight in your research that surprised you as you studied these men? Well, Monroe, for one thing, um, as I say, his papers are, are newly available. He's such an interesting character. I think historians have regarded him as, as dull. And as I say, he was not as intellectually gifted as, his, uh, as the other three members of the dynasty. But he uh, had an enormous temper, as did Washington. And uh, Washington usually managed to control his. Monroe almost always managed, but it was because he would sit down and write these long and insulting memos and letters to Washington in particular, and then not mail it. You know, it's not a bad way. I'm curious though, that he saved it. He uh, saved these scathing letters. They are there in his uh, papers. Maybe he just didn't have time to go through his papers. Madison went through his compulsively and uh, Monroe was, was not quite that way. Madison was careful in what he left behind. He wanted uh, he yes. wanted the record reflected the way uh, he wanted it to be remembered. Yes, Madison had a, an unfortunate love affair. Um, when uh, he was in the uh, Congress, he fell in love with the 15 year old daughter of a fellow congressman. Now 15 was considered quite a marriageable age. And he thought that she reciprocated and Jefferson, who was a, a bit of a meddler, Jefferson uh, went to talk to her to be sure that uh, she understood what a great catch Madison was and that she loved him as he loved her. And she reassured him. And then she broke off the relationship and, and went off with the doctor. Um, Madison was devastated. And he wrote a long letter, not too long actually, a letter to Jefferson describing his feelings. And you can see it now still in his papers. And he scribbled out, hard scribbling out, all of the uh, really personal expressions. At least I'm sure that's what they were, but sure. they're scribbled out. Uh, we won't stay on this too much longer, but but it is interesting. When Monroe wrote these scathing letters to George Washington uh, that he left behind, what kinds of things did he say? What was he angry about? Um, well, he interestingly, he said something that many scholars have said, that Washington was an actor, that he planned, you know, but this was, this was said in the unkindest way. Washington was an actor, and he was not sincere, for example, when he um, uh, gave over his commission to Congress after the revolution, when he resigned and went home to be uh, a farmer in the field. Uh, that this was all just an effort to uh, vaunt uh, his deeds, an effort to make him even more heroic, and that Washington engaged time and again in this kind of activity. And it just irritated Monroe. It, it, was that true? Was George Washington more, <clears throat> pardon me, more calculated than, than we might have thought? Yes, um, there have been a number of books written about uh, the self-invention of George Washington. He definitely did see himself playing a role. Mm. And when he did, though, as in the case of returning his commission to the Congress after the Revolution, it was for good purpose. You know, Monroe just assumed that if you were planning things out for any sort of uh, dramatic effect, that it was evil. Um, it was hypocritical, I think would be the better word. Uh, and so that's, he was very critical. But if you think about it, the gestures that Washington made were good ones. Um, they lifted the nation. So it, it's possible to have a bit of artifice about you and uh, not be a hypocrite. So his motives were good, regardless of yes. uh, 
how he executed them. Uh, maybe, I, uh, Lynn, I think I rescind, given what you just said about uh, George Washington, maybe he would have been outstanding in today's media environment. And so he may, might have become a social media influencer. I see, because he was able to adopt a pose. <laughs> yes, because he was able to you know, maneuver uh, cleverly through that system. At the time. I don't think he would have gone on television for anything. <laughs> really? Interesting. Well, he would have regarded as too uh, too crude a way to communicate with people because you had others interrupting you and you would not always get your full thought across. He just wanted to say what he wanted to say, to do what he wanted to do, always trying to do the right thing, but he didn't want a bunch of interference. You know, on the subject, and I know you've read so many writings, and I have actually two, uh, I, I have some letters that George Washington wrote to one of my descendants and some that he wrote to him. Uh, he served as quartermaster in the, in the war. Um, I, I'm always so impressed and fascinated by the language of the day and how people express themselves. It was so, sometimes it's a bit murky, but it's so eloquent and it's yes. remarkable, really. It is. And, you know, Washington had a lot of his letters uh, written by others. He uh, was particularly fond of Hamilton's way of being able to sort of read what was in Washington's mind and then make it into a letter. So some of those fine expressions, I, I suspect, were Hamilton's invention, but I think many of them are Washington's, too. And though we think of him as not educated, he really did educate himself and uh, and learned. He, he knew about the Enlightenment. He probably knew more about agriculture, but he was a very well-read man. He was self-educated and he was... Yes. You know, yes. Uh, um, this is from, on the subject of language from our audience. And I encourage people who are listening to please send in your questions, use the chat box and, and we'll ask uh, Mrs. Cheney about them. Uh, this is from the audience, Lynn. What can these four presidents teach us about the language of high-level discourse that seems to be lost today? Obviously referring uh, to some of the language used by President Trump and others. It's a, it's a, it's a different environment today. What, what would your thoughts be? What would those presidents think about the level across the board political discourse today? Well, they would be appalled. Um, they knew how to uh, write really... Um, telling insults uh, and, and did that, not, not Washington, but the others did that in newspapers. They would call one another names and so on, but they still managed to do it in a pretty elevated way. Mm -hmm. And they always signed their names um, with a, a, a pseudonym. Um, Publius was the pseudonym or the false name they used when, when they wrote the Federalist. So that really gave a certain elevation um, to their discourse as well. They also had good educations, um, sure. and um, it, it helps uh, when you talk if you know something. <laughs> that's sort of that's sort of a, uh, a fundamental, I think, with expressing. You have to have a good idea before you can express it, right? Um, how was was how has your experience uh, as Second Lady of the United States shaped your? view of American history. This is also something that an audience member wants to know, but I'll bounce on that. How, how, did, how did it shape your uh, view as an author as well and what you wanted to pursue as you wrote about American history? When uh, Dick was selected to be vice president, I was writing a book of, about education and what had gone wrong. But so Dick is on the ticket. Uh, George W. Bush's main uh, campaign plank is about education. You know, I decided I better let that go for a while. It's not so good to have, you know, the wife of your vice president writing and perhaps disagreeing uh, with uh, your, your platform ideas. Right. That's when I turned to writing children's books. I thought that would be safe. It was the most amazing and enlightening experience because it underscored uh, what I had suspected that we are really not teaching our children about the past mm. and that our schools, um, un, uh, not the fault of teachers who, who don't get a chance to learn enough about substantive subjects to, uh, you know, to teach history in depth, for example, hardworking, well-intentioned. And I think there is a great lack in our schools. The textbooks are usually not very good. 
So I, I thought long and hard about uh, how this could be fixed and, you know, felt very discouraged. But it did occur to me that parents and grandparents, I was a grandmother at the time, mm. the parents and grandparents could help a lot if they would um, become acquainted with uh, the most interesting details of American history and teach them to, uh, to their offspring and their grand offspring. Mm. The books I wrote for children were intended you know, to help in that effort. And I have to say, I, uh, I still run across people I say, I read that book to my daughter or I'll run across the daughter and the daughter will say, my mother read that to me. So they've had a very long half-life and uh, they, they were very gratifying to, uh, to, to write and uh, to have uh, given to people. I would imagine that, that in some ways those were as satisfying as anything else you've written because yes. of who you're, I, who you're uh, affecting and who you're reaching. Well, there's that, but I had someone I, the other day, I was saying, well, maybe I should write another children's book. And they said, well, that would be easy, you know, but it's <laughs> not easy. It's hard in almost the opposite way that writing a book like the Virginia Dynasty is. It's like writing haiku, I once thought, because you have these really complicated and important ideas and you have to get them into five words. So it's not easy. And picking out the events that you want to talk about is not easy. Um, but as I say, it was all very rewarding. That's a, an excellent point. You have to distill very complex ideas uh, down in a way that a young person can really uh, identify and understand it. That is a, that is a unique challenge as a, compared to writing for adults. It is. You, you can stretch out a little bit more when you right. write for adults, um, but you also have to you know, do footnotes. And uh, while I love the research, uh, documenting the research is a little bit of a pain. And oh, there must have been 40 pages. Actually, I documented my children's books. Did They're you really? footnoted so, so that kids and their parents could understand the importance of fact, the yeah. importance of facts, and, uh, and know that what I was writing was based on fact. Well, this book clearly is, I, I, I'm not sure how many pages, but it seemed 30 or 40 pages of references. I mean, this book was highly documented. I get so irritated when I'm reading a book and uh, I want to see, oh, where did this quote, quote come from? It's so eloquent. And the book has no footnotes. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, sometimes you can Google it and find it, but not having footnotes uh, seems just irresponsible to me. Well, it does. It's sort of, it's very not academic. And it also is frustrating to the reader who may want to, to read more and go to source material and go a little further. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, we're speaking with Lynn Cheney, former second lady of the United States and author of the Virginia Dynasty, Four Presidents and the Creation of the American Nation. Lynn, it, it f struck me as we're talking as being so fascinating that you having uh, served in the administration and been in government with your, your husband, living American history, being part of American government, also now writing about it for all of those years. You had a unique vantage point and certainly a unique connection with uh, American history. I think that's true. And, uh, you know, I think it gives me um, an appreciation of things I might not otherwise appreciate, such as the very important role of wives. And uh, so I look when I'm, I'm writing a, a biography or a, a group biography, I, I look for, okay, what were their marriages like? Um, what, were their, what was their family life like when they were growing up? You know, those, those things interest me. Sure. Perhaps just because they're interesting, but I also think having seen uh, the sort of background against which great national events take place, that probably helps account for my interest. Well, I, th I think that's, uh, they are, it is interesting, but it's also very informative. And, and uh, what kind of background, what, helped, what formed these men and also what sustained them in terms of their partners. I mean, you know, legendary stories about Martha Washington. Did you learn anything interesting about their, their wives or their families? Well, three of them uh, lost their fathers at a young age. Uh, Washington, Jefferson and Monroe. 
And I wonder if that doesn't uh, encourage an early sense of, of responsibility, uh, an early uh, sense of those factors that go into leadership. That's all speculation, but I found that interesting. Um, Washington, Martha was a totally comforting wife. Mm -hmm. She traveled to the camps where the troops were staying during the revolution, during deep winter, and it brought him comfort. He also had an eye for women. And uh, at one point he said to another woman, he said of Martha, you know, our, our letters to one another, Martha's and mine, uh, will show that we have a, uh, a nice friendship. Now, I'm sure Martha Washington wouldn't have liked his saying that uh, very much. But she was a comforting wife. She brought a lot of money to the marriage. And uh, I think she was probably the perfect person for him in those uh, catastrophic times. She was uh, a genuine partner from everything I've read. Uh, and yes. it what about the other men? Well, you know, Jefferson, of course, lost his wife at a young age. He uh, then had a, a long relationship with Sally Hemings, who was a, a slave at, uh, at Monticello. Uh, they had children. Uh, Jefferson, as you pointed out earlier, didn't have, uh, you know, tons of money. Uh, but when he died, and, and that meant he, like Madison and Monroe, couldn't afford to free slaves. You know, you, if you freed a slave, you had to get the slave out of state. This was what Virginia um, mandated. Uh, you were supposed to be sure that the slave was the enslaved person. I like that much better, mm -hmm. that the enslaved person was uh, able to earn a living. Well, that too added to expense. And Washington was really the only one who could afford a gesture like freeing his slaves uh, when he died. Uh, it sometimes goes unnoticed that he did not and could not free Martha's slaves. Right. So even after he undertook this, uh, uh, after he undertook emancipation and provided for education and provided for uh, kind of internships, so you learned how to be a carpenter, for example, uh, there were still 150 or more slaves at uh, at Mount Vernon. That belonged to Martha, but he did not have the uh, power to free those slaves. Exactly. They were dower slaves. And when Martha died, uh, they were to go and did go uh, to her family, the Custis family. I see. How it's, you know, it, this is an interesting uh, topic for this interesting time. Mm -hmm. How do we reconcile these great men with? who had remarkable ideas about what the country should be, but who were also slave owners. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, there, are, there are always moves underfoot, and certainly that's gathered some steam to, to really re-examine, maybe even rename uh, monuments and schools because of, of, of past uh, transgressions by some of uh, our, our, our founding fathers. How do we put that in context today? And, and, and come to terms with the fact that the, the, the men who wrote about liberty and justice for all kept slaves. First of all, you have to recognize that they couldn't reconcile holding uh, people in slavery and uh, advocating the ideas that they did. All of them through their lives um, said how grim, how awful, how sinful slavery was. Uh, Jefferson called it a sin against God. I mean, they, they did not uh, uh, hold back when it came to uh, condemning slavery. But, but yet they didn't release their, I mean, they kept slaves. That's true. And they couldn't find a way to achieve the kind of total emancipation that justice demanded. Uh, it was simply not possible. If everyone in Virginia was to free his or her slaves, the result threatened to be uh, chaos and perhaps uh, violence. Um, both Madison and uh, Monroe were part of this uh, idea to uh, encourage emancipation by providing uh, slaves that were freed, uh, who were emancipated, 
an opportunity to go to Africa. And for a while, this was regarded as uh, uh, an important thing by abolitionists, as well as those who held slaves. Uh, but then it turned and it began to seem like a, a device for making slavery look better than it was. And uh, for making life in Africa um, seemed desirable to, uh, to people, uh, former slaves who had grown up in Virginia, who thought of Virginia as their home. Some did go to Africa, some thrived, but on the whole, the whole project was a failure. I see. Uh, Lynn, from, our, from a member of the audience, and again, I encourage everyone listening to please send us your questions. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions of these men, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, either individually or collectively, however you choose to answer that? Well, we, we have begun to get away. We, we've gotten away from the idea that uh, they were perfect, from the idea that they were marble figures who never did anything wrong or had a bad thought. We've, we've gotten away from that. And I hope that it, when I write about them, um, I, make that, uh, I make that very clear. The, you mentioned a minute ago the uh, place we've gotten to now where statues are being thrown into rivers and, and uh, decapitated and so on. You know, that's, that's a mixed bag. Um, I have no problem with taking down Confederate statues. I uh, wish we would do it in an orderly fashion. Uh, but, you know, these people were, well, this is a strong word, uh, traitors to the Union, to the Constitution. And however fine their personalities might have been, there's no reason to decorate the American landscape uh, with Confederate soldiers in particular. Washington, that's a different thing. Jefferson's different. Uh, Madison and Monroe are different. They did, they did indispensable things. They held slaves, they enslaved people, that is true. But they also put forward the ideas that our country is based on. The ideas that Jefferson captured in the uh, Declaration of Independence. There's a, there's a tendency now to say, well, those ideas are sort of phony because, uh, you know, Jefferson had slaves. Um, they weren't phony. Th those were ideas in which they deeply and firmly believed. And I worry that um, with all of the tearing down of statues and people uh, just, uh, just destroying things, destroying our history. Uh, I worry that we're losing those ideals, that we're forgetting how they hold us together. Uh, they're kind of glue um, that holds us together. And when we throw those over the side, I think we're in deep trouble. Hmm. Well, and as you say, they were flawed men, brilliant men, uh, men with deep conviction and vision, but they were flawed men, but they did set in motion a, a document and, and, a, and a society that allowed uh, things, uh, allowed for self-correction, allowed us to end slavery, allowed us to uh, form, quote unquote, that more perfect union. I mean, that's exactly. the real genius of what they did. Frederick Douglass um, praised... Uh, the Constitution on the grounds that it had nothing in it that uh, um, gave sanction to slavery. And Madison had been very intentional about uh, keeping any such uh, matter out. And that if people just paid attention to the preamble in order to form a more perfect union, the nation would be free of slaves and uh, free of most other, um, how shall I say it, moral liabilities. Right. Lincoln also, uh, he praised Jefferson, though he didn't really like Jefferson the man. Um, he, he praised him for putting the idea of freedom um, in the Declaration, whereas Lincoln said it would be a warning forever to those who would uh, move us in a different direction. So their ideas about fr their, their Enlightenment ideas um, were the most powerful weapon against slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a good way. It's a good thing to remember that at the same time, while, uh, um, being sure that, uh, we all agree, including men I write about that, uh, 
enslaving people was an abomination. Yeah, we we can acknowledge that uh, unfortunate reality, but but you, you, we can't discard what they created. Obviously, uh, despite that. Well, it, what, what was it that Abraham Lincoln didn't like about Thomas Jefferson? They, Thomas Jefferson, they strike me as very different personalities. He, by the time uh, Lincoln um, was, I don't know, involved in the Lincoln-Douglas debates or, you know, later in his career, uh, not while he was president, but he learned about Jefferson's affair with Sally Hemings. And this appalled him. And I think that was the thing that... Uh, that most made him think that Jefferson was not a man of high character. I see. Uh, curious, were there, I know obviously the Lincoln Douglas, Douglas debates are, are incredibly uh, storied and famous, but what about uh, earlier on? Were there debates? We have a presidential debate tonight between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Were there debates in those days uh, uh, involving the four men you wrote about? Well, nothing uh, on the order of uh, Lincoln Douglas or even on the order of what we're going to see tonight. I mean, I have my popcorn ready. I hope, I hope you do too. It's, <laughs> it's, it's going to be fascinating. fascinating. Yeah. Um, they, Monroe, who always envied Madison a little bit and wanted to outshine him, ran against Madison for Congress um, very early on. And the two of them traveled together, would go up on the stoop of churches and uh, talk to crowds about their different ideas, but it wasn't the kind of formal and intense thing, certainly, that uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates were. You know, I forgot one thing. You asked me about wives. Um, of course, the most outstanding wife was Dolly Madison. Right. And uh, I think that's one of the, a tribute to Madison's character, uh, that he married someone so outgoing, he was not afraid of being outshone. He was not even afraid of being, uh, of having his diminutive size emphasized. Um, Dolly was taller than he, and when they went on special occasions, she wore um, peacock feathers in her turban. So in the end, she was probably a foot or more <laughs> taller than he. But you know, he he loved her flamboyance and uh, her warm character, and of course, she was unusual in uh, putting herself forward. She didn't mind at all um, making clear um, to history that she had had a role, for example, when the White House burned down, that she had had a role in rescuing George Washington's paintings. It's hard not to admire her and like her because uh, she was uh, so forward-leaning and so unafraid. More forward-leaning and unafraid than most women of the day? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, Dolly... Um, the letter uh, to her sister in which she wrote about uh, the burning of the White House in 1814, it's, it's a kind of a three-day letter. It's really kind of an essay about what happened. And of course, she kept it. So she wanted it known that she had a role in history. Um, most women, even if they'd had a chance to have such a role, and even if they had written it down, they would have burned such a letter before they died. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This, uh, Lynn, this is from a, a member of our audience. And again, please send your questions uh, in the time we have remaining. We've talked a lot about uh, the, the successes of these four men. Mm -hmm. uh, the person in the audience would like to know about their failures. What have you learned about their failures? And what do you write about? Uh, well, part of, uh, part of it is what we talked about earlier. Um, Washington had, you know, minor financial troubles toward the end of his life, but Jefferson essentially went bankrupt, um, and his children had to, uh, dispose of his assets when he died. Uh, it was interesting. One of the things that forced him into bankruptcy was he signed a note for 40, I think 20 or 40, I can't remember, thousand dollars for a friend, and then the friend defaulted. Cool. And this just added on top of, uh, the financial difficulties Jefferson already had. Madison too um, died, uh, broke essentially. Um, he blamed much of this and rightfully so on a man named Payne Todd, who was Dolly's son, who Madison had helped raise and was just a ne'er-do-well. You know, he gambled, he drank, uh, Madison had to bail him out of jail. Um, 
he was a very expensive uh, stepson. And uh, Monroe, interesting. Here's Monroe. We'd say, well, he's not quite as smart as the others. He had a certain practical streak and perseverance about him. He was going broke too, but he insisted to the Congress and he insisted again and again and again that he was owed money by the United States government for expenses that hadn't been covered while he was serving in Europe. Hmm. And it's true, he hadn't been paid. Um, he also had friends remind the Congress that they had just given Lafayette uh, $200,000 for, uh, for his service in the revolution. And you know, Monroe was seriously wounded at the uh, Battle right. of Trenton. In the end, Monroe got the money. And uh, so while he was very poor at the end, he uh, was able to save his home uh, for his children, and they were able to keep it for at least a while. Lynn, why did did these men s struggle financially at the end? Was it just a changing time, and they had the climate had changed in terms of business and agriculture, or, uh, or were they just not very good businessmen? What what was the reason? Well, I think they were in an unfortunate business. Um, all of them, I think, I, I can think of two or three, um, acknowledge that uh, slavery was simply not a good model for running a business. You know, if you had to make people work by threatening punishment, it, it simply uh, wasn't the way to uh, have people be productive. Um, besides <laughs> being evil, it didn't, it didn't work very well. Um, moreover, uh, all of them talked about having, you know, a third to two thirds of the, the enslaved people on their farms, um, young babies or old who needed taken care of. So, so again, um, this, this wasn't a model where people could take care of their own older people, where they could uh, afford really to give their children what they needed. Um, I think that was part of it. Part of it, too, was the time. The Panic of 1819 uh, drove down the, uh, the price for produce uh, to a terrible low. Okay. It also um, made property uh, worth very little. So um, while Washington, when he was alive, was able to sell a parcel of land um, uh -huh. when his expenses didn't meet his, uh, uh, when his expenses exceeded his outgo, when he was uh, hurting, he could do that, but the others couldn't because by the time they were in deep trouble, uh, the panic occurred. And this was 19 years after Washington died. So they found themselves in a very different economic world. Yeah, George Washington had a huge expanse of land, did he not? Yes. Uh, well, he had many farms. You know, you think of Mount Vernon and that was just, you know, very small part of it. Okay. Um, this is from uh, one, a member of our audience. An interesting question for someone who has done so much research uh, over the years on American history and American president's land. Do you have a favorite president and favorite first or second lady? Present company accepted. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I really admire Madison, uh, his steadiness. Really? He was very smart. He, uh, he knew how to do research. He prepared for the Constitutional Convention by writing a history of republics and showing why some had failed, most had failed, but very small ones had worked. And this, this gave him much food for thought. So I just love his steadiness. You know, he is the man you could depend upon in a crisis. And I love Dolly. I mean, what a fantastic woman. Just to write about her is fun because her clothes were so extravagant. There was one outfit made of pink velvet and and draped with uh, chains. And then of course the turban and the great peacock feathers coming from it. She's hard not to uh, just be fascinated with. Yeah, I have not, other than, <clears throat> pardon me, your book, I really had not read that much about Dolly Madison. You're right, she was uh, uh, way ahead of her time in terms of where most women were in terms of their place in society and place uh, with their, their husbands. She was fascinating. She was, uh, very vibrant. Absolutely. And I'm not sure when they married, she was deeply in love with him. Mm. Um, she uh, probably, with a little help from friends, 
um, came to think of him as a good catch, somebody that would be nice to spend time with, someone who would ensure that her son uh, grew up with uh, some prospects. Uh, but it, in a letter that she wrote on the, the evening that she married him, she signed it, alas, alas, alas. <laughs> and I've always thought that meant, um, I'm doing this thing because it's good for me and it's good for Payne Todd. But it also then turned out to be uh, good for a fascinating life. Yeah. How, you know, we, we've we talked a lot here today about uh, uh, making sure, and, and one of your goals has always been to, to not to view these men as not just marble statues. Mm -hmm. uh, they had tempers, they had failings. Did they have a sense of humor? They, they were friends, uh, at least during parts of their lives. Did they uh, share jokes together and, 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 and laugh? Were they, were they fun to be around? You have to uh, understand that we have most of our knowledge of them from letters, but you can see in letters between Madison and Jefferson, this sort of wink, wink about Monroe. You know, um, after he ran against Madison, he ran against Madison several times. And after one of those times, um, Jefferson, I'm sorry, Madison wrote to Jefferson and said, well, I, I think that no matter he did this, our friendship is still intact. And then he added sort of dash, dash, at least on one side, I'm sure it is. <laughs> because, you know, he knew Monroe was not uh, one to forgive and forget easily. Madison was supposed to have a great store of body jokes that he, uh, B A W D Y jokes that he told <laughs> that he told to men after dinner, but uh, so far as I know, I, there's no record of them. They weren't uh, written down. Uh, it's 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 really it's so uh, interesting to flesh them out more and take them from beyond just the pages of history and and think about them as um, as just ordinary men, even though they were living in extraordinary times and doing extraordinary things. Um, did they have any, this is from, from the audience, I'm trying to get the last few questions in from our audience and the moments we have left. Did, did these men have any, any interesting hobbies? Hmm. Well, Jefferson, Jefferson, of course, loved to invent things. and Yes, I mean, that was his hobby, was uh, uh, going around and, and making new kinds of plows and uh, um, he just had lots of hobbies. He uh, had trained, um, oh, what's the wonderful kind of bird uh, that sings so well? Mockingbirds. Mockingbird. He, he had a series of mockingbirds for pets and they would sit on his shoulder as he, he went around, uh, he went around uh, Monticello. Um, so that's not one hobby. He just, but he had so many interests, so many interests. What about the other men? Well, I'm trying to think. They spent a lot of time uh, worrying about agriculture and became fascinated with uh, the idea of being able to improve what was really the poor soil of Virginia, poor soil that had been further um, decimated by hundreds of years of tobacco growth. So they, they joined farmer societies. They read books on agriculture. Um, it was kind of a hobby. Uh, it was a hobby that would pay off if it worked. Lynn, I've often thought, in fact, I just had this conversation on a walk with my fiance yesterday uh, about George Washington, but I've often thought, <clears throat> one of, in history, it's always fascinating to think, <clears throat> pardon me, what if the Wright brothers were to come back today and see how we all fly around on jets? What if Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and George Washington and James Monroe were to see where the United States is today and to see what they created and what it has become, what do you think they would think and feel about it? Well, I think first of all, they would just be struck down almost by the noise, the confusion, um, the, the, the booming, uh, the buzzing that's going on all around. But I've also thought that it would be technology that would uh, most just gobsmack them. The mm -hmm. idea that uh, you and I can have this talk from opposite sides of the continent yeah, right. and uh, send it out to other people. Um, the idea that you can uh, get into a, a jet and go somewhere that you'd like in the world, or at least pre-COVID days. Um, <laughs> the, the idea that uh, 
people are going to Mars and uh, that uh, people have gone to the moon. Uh, these things would have stunned them. I think government has grown so complicated that it would take them a while to figure out where the republic they created existed still inside of this uh, inside of this big structure. But, you know, I, I think of myself, if I were to not know anything and I came to the United States today, I would be stunned by technology. Yeah. It's, it's changed us. It's changed us in just even the last 10 or 20 years dramatically, yes. uh, much less 200 years in their time. Would, would, do you think they would be able to find the democracy that they created in our society today? It's much more complex, but is the core of it still there? Do you think they would see the core of it? Well, the, uh, um, what they would see is that we have representative government and uh, that is uh, what they had intended from the beginning. It's a republic. You, the people elect people to represent them. So they would see that. Uh, they would see the presidency, I think, as an incredibly powerful institution, one much more powerful um, with uh, far-reaching influence than anything uh, that, that they had thought of. Um, what else? Would, they, would that concern them? Yes. It would. I'm um, partly, and I'm not making a judgment about whether, uh, you know, they, they would say it's right or wrong for us, but it was so different from what they had fought for. You know, they did not want a, a president who seemed in any way like a king. Uh, and of course now, uh, well, many years ago, we had people writing about the imperial presidency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. The judiciary. They all worried about the judiciary taking over uh, uh, and claiming, as it happened in uh, Jefferson's time, and claiming that they had the right uh, to uh, say what the Constitution meant. And I, you know, I think they would be amused by that to see how far uh, how far that has been carried. What do you think would make them proud mm. of where we are today? Well, I think they would have been a little prouder maybe 10 years ago. Uh, they knew patriotism was very important. And uh, patriotism has, uh, you know, it, it, in some quarters, it's become a kind of joke. Now, I certainly don't think it is. I think it's part of that glue, you know, that holds us together, that we love this country, we honor this country. But when you say that the country was uh, corrupt from its beginnings, you know, you don't have those ideas that uh, that make you patriotic. So patriotism, wherever they found it, would have been uh, very gratifying. Lynn, I'm going to ask you the final question here. One, of, But before, let me just say, you know, one of my favorite quotes uh, about this country, I'm an optimistic person by nature, but one of my favorite quotes is there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed by what is right with America. Oh, that's very nice. You know, and I think that sense of, of optimism and, and hope can can continue to guide us. The final question, Lynn, what would you encourage uh, readers or what do you hope readers will take away from this terrific book you've written? Well, I think that there's an interesting human dimension. You know, what happens when you put four people uh, who know about the most important ideas in the world, when you put them in one place? Uh, I think that it helps make them greater that uh, they, they, ideas spark off one another. They're, they're inspired, they help one another. So I, I hope that human dynamic comes through. What I also hope is that the amazing deeds of these four men um, are, are remembered. We, we've just talked about the Declaration and the Constitution, Bill of Rights a little, but they doubled the size of the nation. That's what happened under Jefferson. Um, they had a second revolution against uh, England and became recognized as a power that people should be uh, pay attention to. And that was Madison. And Monroe, of course, um, relying heavily on John Quincy Adams, set forth the Monroe Doctrine. You know, this is our hemisphere and you shouldn't, shouldn't mess around in it. He also extended the border of the United States to California. So we need to know those things about them too. 
I'm glad he did. I'm in California now. <laughs> uh, Lynn, Lynn Cheney, thank you so much. This has just been, <clears throat> pardon me, an absolutely fascinating conversation. And the book you've written, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I know people who read it will as well. Well, uh, thank, thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Just terrific. Our thanks to Lynn Cheney, author of the Virginia Dynasty, Four Presidents and the Creation of the American Nation. It's really a fascinating read, incredibly well written and incredibly well researched. We encourage you to pick up a copy of Lynn's new book at your local uh, bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts, please visit uh, commonwealthclub.org. Lynn, thank you again. Great pleasure. Well, again, thank you. It was a fascinating hour. All right, thank you. Uh, that is our uh, program for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm Dan Ashley from ABC 7 News and a Commonwealth Club board member and your moderator for today. Thank you for being with us. We hope you enjoyed it.